Hi right, traders, we are live. Can I like uh, get a sound test or something so that I know that you guys can hear me? Is the sound well? Let me know. And I'm here for you. Uh, if you have any questions, Let's keep it open. Um, and just let me know how you're doing. How was your day? I had a tough day today. I have to say, I mean, I finished up like $450, but uh, that wasn't easy. Quite a hard time. Worked hard for my money today. So, sounds good. Okay, great, great. So just let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I already see that uh, some questions are posted. So I'll try and start and answering some of your earlier questions. And uh, if you have any new, anything you want me to answer, let me know. I'm here with you for the next 30 minutes or so. I have a question here about uh, the Russian version of uh, the Market Whisper, my book. Well, uh, is there is there a Russian Kindle op um, option? I'm not aware because I do know that uh, it's supposed to be on. It's supposed to be on Amazon. Let me just take a look at the Russian version here. But I don't know if there's a Kindle version version is possible I should ask my publisher to uh, to do that too And I'm still looking for more questions here. I think we've got some. So you're struggling, Adam, with some. It's cutting my windows too early. How do I recommend to fix that? Um, maybe range order? No, no, absolutely not. Or take profits to one to one or more crystal water to help you. Okay. If you're struggling with uh, taking uh, a profit with your winners, uh, let me say this: um, it's 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 not an easy job to um, to get to the point where you stop your losers early and you take your winners all the way. It's a very tough thing to do. It's not easy. It comes in time. Uh, but certainly one-to-one -one risk reward will help you. So it's something that you need to learn in time, but uh, try practicing the one-to-one -one risk reward. I personally take one-to-one -one risk reward. Um, it's not that it is the right thing to do because every trader should behave in a different way. Every trader has his own system. My system works great with one-to-one -one risk reward. Actually, let me ask you, what is your risk reward? And, it, and, and again, there's no wrong answer here, but what is your risk, risk reward? Like if you're risking 30 cents, um, what would be your profit? Would you look for one to one, meaning another 30 cents or one to two? Are you looking for 60 cents if you're risking 30? What's yours? What's your risk reward? Just write it down and let's see if, uh, you know, what's, what most people are trading. I mean, what you guys, are trading with. So if you don't mind sharing, am I looking the wrong way? Because I don't see any answers to now. Oh, no, I do. <laughs> so Will has uh, two to one, David has uh, one to one, and We've got another one to one, one to one, three to one, one to one, three to one. Okay, uh, so, well, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantage of uh, a three to one or a two to one. 
So you 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 risking let's say you're working with a one uh, with with a thirty cent stop loss and a sixty cent target. Now, if you're good enough, you're gonna find enough trades that um, can do that. And uh, the problem is finding those trades, and it's not easy. And it's more likely that you'll be trading some. Um, you'll be taking some trades that uh, you'll be struggling with trying to get to the uh, one to two or even one to three risk reward. So let's just start with the basics. The basics is like that. If you risk 30 cents and you try to gain 30 cents, you have a chance of a monkey, which means whatever you're going to click on, you're going to get 50% chance, right? If you're risking 30 cents and you're trying to get 30 cents. Now, if you have the right uh, technical formation and if you are working with the market direction and you're working with the stocks direction, that means you're in the right trend and a good technical formation. And a lot of people are going to help you because uh, technical analysis is more like a self-fulfilling prophecy, meaning there's a lot of people who are going to help you once they get to the same point you do. So if you... If you're working according to technical analysis rules and and more, and you're experienced, of course, then you're going to get more than 50%. So my percentage uh, is 68%. I do I do well 68% of the time. Well, not today really, but on a regular day I would do 68%. On an average day I would do 68%. So if I'm getting a 68%, that is due to the fact that I'm working with a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio. If you're starting with one to two, then to start with, you do not have a 50% chance. Let's say you have, I mean, mathematically speaking, less than 40%. So now you're trying to get to the point where you're making money. Sure, you will. Even if you're going to succeed in 40% of the time, you're still going to make money because you're going to be winning twice as much as you will be losing. And that is great. So you can still do money with a 40% success rate. Uh, but there's a problem with that. That's a problem. The problem is it doesn't build up your confidence. So you need to build, in order to build your confidence, in my opinion, you need more than 50% chance to win. I mean, if you're going to win just 60 out of 100 trades, does that build your confidence? A little bit. 65%, much more. Close to 70%, like I do, much, much more. Uh, and it's still hard and it's not easy, even with 68%. I'm not telling you that I'm very confident that sometimes, like today, I started with two losers and I finished with another two winners and end result, I'm green. But after two trades, after two losing trades, my confidence level was not that high. So you see, one-to-one -one risk reward ratio would boost up your confidence. You need to look for stocks that are right for one to one and that is of course more opportunities than one to two or one to three so it gives you more opportunities builds up your confidence and now you need to make your choice and i don't know what is your choice but uh, for new traders uh, to build up confidence is very 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 uh, important very important so again it's all about you and what you choose Um, let's see if there's more questions here. Yeah, Linux man, you mentioned earlier, I read that, that uh, the S&P 500 is made out of 500 stocks. And the question is, why do I believe that uh, stocks will follow the S&P 500? and not the S&P 500 would actually follow the stocks. Well, of course you're right, but um, there are several things uh, to say about that. First of all, um, it, it starts with the result, meaning yes, there's 500 stocks which are uh, part of the S&P 500, and these 500 stocks uh, are, 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 I mean, the outcome of uh, what they're doing is going to move the S&P 500. So if they're going to move the S&P 500, uh, then of course they are the first movers. But each stock is just one out of the 500. And there's a rule with institutional traders. They are looking at S&P 500. They're not looking at the individual stocks. They're trading individual stocks, but they're looking at the S&P 500. Now imagine this. I'm just going to tell you that. If the institutional traders are watching the S&P 500 and 
they're making decisions according to the S&P 500, not according to an individual stock, which is, of course, maybe a part of the 500. Oh, by the way, it does not necessarily have to be because there's approximately 3,000 stocks I trade. Uh, stocks with, uh, which are over $10, uh, stocks which are over 1 million shares a day volume. So all of these stocks are not a part of the S&P 500. I mean, 500 of them will be, the rest 2,500 won't be. So um, I'm looking at those stocks too. I mean, these 2,500 stocks other than the 500, which are a part of the S&P, of course, are also important. So let's, but let's even talk about a stock that is within the S&P 500, because that's probably your question, because the rest are a clear game. So stocks which are in the S&P 500, if the institutional traders are trading them according to the S&P 500 direction, that means the dog is the S&P, and the stock is just the tail, and the tail is not waving the dog, the dog is waving the tail. And that means that each small part of the S&P 500 is first going to be influenced by the S&P 500, most likely 80% of the time, but it could be different. It could be that the first that the stock will make the first move. So it's not something that you can 100% trust, but you, and you don't use it by just, I mean, I mean you don't use it as a single law that is, one law, which is the most important law in trading, that first you watch the S&P 500, then you watch the stock that you're trading. And that is because institutional traders are, in fact, watching the S&P 500 and making decisions according to the S&P 500. Therefore, the stock you will be trading is very, very likely to be influenced from the S&P 500 and move after the S&P 500 and not the other way around. Plus, of course, remember all the 2,500 shares which are not a part of the S&P 500. I hope that answered your question because, you know, once I teach this issue about uh, the S&P 500, it gets much more into details. But you know what? Just believe me for now. It works well. It works well. The best way for you to uh, check it out really is just put up the S&P 500 chart and another three stocks, possibly, another three stocks, and start looking at the relationship between them. Now, don't do it with Apple, okay? Do it with smaller S&P stocks and with some, just choose one of them, and with one or two that has nothing to do with S&P. So those stocks which are not in the S&P, and there's thousands of them, which are high volume over $10, those stocks will be influenced too. So the S&P 500 tool is the first tool I teach in day trading, and it's the most important tool out there. So you should probably be following it. What about big gappers? Big gappers are not usually influenced, uh, Julian, by the S&P 500. Well, okay. So we go back to the institutional traders. The institutional traders are the one who are influencing the stock that you're trading and that's the rule of the s p 500 as i just mentioned uh, but uh, institutional traders are not trading for their own account they're not trading for their own money they're not trying to just like us make 30 cents here, 30 cents they can't they are trading millions of shares and they can't uh, control millions of shares in the way that we do i mean they are influencing the market therefore if you're following the institutional traders um you, well, institutional traders are, are trading millions of shares at a time. I mean, not at a time, slowly. Like, they'll be told, please sell this share, this stock for, uh, and you have a quantity to sell, like, let's say, 1 million shares or 2 million shares, start selling. They won't do it immediately because otherwise they will drive the price down. So institutional traders will start trading a stock for the next week, 2 weeks, 3 weeks, maybe a few days. Uh, trying to get rid of 1 million shares or trying to buy 1 million or 2 million shares. So they're working slowly to buy or sell uh, stocks. Uh, they're not doing it for their own account. They're doing it for their customers, for example, a fund that wants to get rid of a stock, doesn't matter which, let's say Apple, uh, would approach a company like, uh, let's say, Goldman Sachs and say, please sell 1 million shares of Apple. So they will start selling it slowly, so they will not drive the price down. Or if they're buying, they don't want to drive the price up because they want to buy cheap. 
buying cheap means more commission for them. So at the point, they will have an agreement with the institutional, with the fund uh, that will say, uh, we're doing what we're doing. We're buying the 1 million shares or we're selling the 1 million shares. But do you really want us to continue selling if the price came down today by 3%, 4%, 5%? Well, the answer is no. They would have that in the agreement. So when the price is moving over a certain level or under a certain level, they will stop. What is that level? I don't know. It's within the it's in the agreement between them and the fund. It could be different, but the majority would be around 3%. So if stock is getting up or down more than 3%, institutional traders are not likely to trade it. I mean, most of them, some of them will, but those who would stop trading them would stop influencing them and therefore the stock will be less influenced by institutional traders and that means that uh, it the rule that i just mentioned with the institutional traders first moving uh, uh this i mean the s p moving and then the institutional traders starting to uh, show you where the stock is going to move uh, that rule does not apply for stocks that are getting uh, that are gapping uh, more than 3%. So that would be uh, up or down more than 3%. It wouldn't be, um, uh, those stock would not be influenced by the S&P 500 that much. Hope I answered this question. Mm. Let's see if I missed any more questions. Why do I only <laughs> I trade the morning session, Vadim? Um, well, tell you what, I was trading uh, the whole day. I was trading the whole six and a half hours, took a lunch break for an hour maybe for so many years. I've been trading for the past 18 years. And I got tired of it. Really, I do. I mean, it's not about making money anymore because I made enough. It's about just got tired of it. That's it. I really, really enjoy trading, but I don't enjoy trading for more than one or one and a half hour. That's it. Now, the most interesting part is the beginning, the right after the bell. So I, 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 I trade that part because I love it. I love doing that. But if you ask me to trade more than 90 minutes a day i'm not enjoying this anymore as i did and i don't need the money anymore now if i really really needed the money i could probably make not much more i mean 50 percent more because most of my profit is during the first one or one and a half hour so on average i could probably maybe double maybe go up 50 percent on average i could lose what i'm making on the first hour too but on average i would probably make some more that when I'm when I'm doing the calculation and I'm not enjoying that as much as I used to in the past, then I just don't care about trading more than just one or one and a half hour, and it has nothing to do with money because I don't. I mean, I'm, I made enough money uh, for me and for my and for my kids to 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 sail into the sunset, and I don't need to work a day in my life anymore. So it's not about money anymore. It's just about enjoying. I love trading. It's fun. It's just like going to the casino every day. I don't know if you guys go to the casino or you gamble. I enjoy doing that, but same thing. I was uh, just, uh, you know, two or three weeks ago, I was in uh, in Monte Carlo. And I went to the casino like uh, three times, I believe. I uh, lost twice, made some money once. I wasn't there for more than two hours. I didn't enjoy being there for more than two hours. You get in, you play a little bit, you lose or you win. Uh, you drink, uh, you have a drink, you look around, um, nice atmosphere. So I think, but, and that's it. I don't, I don't enjoy it anymore. I mean, that that's fun and it's finished. So I have uh, this uh, live casino here every day at home. What's nicer than that, really? I enjoy my life this way. Okay, more questions. Great, great, Alan. I, I really 
appreciate your uh, your post here. Glad to see that. Uh, glad to hear that you like us and looking forward to trading with you. I mean, one of the nicest thing, Alan, you know, is that uh, um, I meet a lot of people. Yeah, that's really great. I mean, that's an online meeting, but I'm traveling quite a lot. Like um, in two weeks from now, two weeks approximately, I'm going to be in uh, like two weeks in. Uh, I'm going to spend two weeks in India, and there's a lot of people I'm meeting there because there's, there's people along my route that would like to meet you. I'm going to have beer with somebody here or there, and I went to France. I met a person. I'm. I'm meeting a lot of people live every day, and that's so nice. That's so great. I really enjoy that. So that's that's a part of what I really like to do. Uh, what intraday scans uh, do I run once the market is open? I don't. I don't hit them. Um, you know, if I would have traded the next few hours, I would probably do that. And I used to do that, but I don't. I mean, the only thing I'm using really is just my uh, top 20 on my uh, trading platform. So on my Colmex trading platform, I have a top 20, which shows me uh, the gappers. And then I'm just switching between them, looking if something, uh, not only gappers, big movers. So I'm looking at big mover. I'm looking at stocks that are big mover. That's the only kind of scan I'm doing. And that's using my top 20. Um, but but it's not wrong to use different scans. Uh, there's a lot of readers who do that. That depends on your style. That depends on your system. And I just personally don't do that. But there's plenty of people in the trading room who do that. And they're successful doing that. And there's nothing wrong about that. Just it's not right for me. And and again, I'm concentrating on the first 60 or 90 minutes. And that's and I have enough candidates starting my morning. Like I, I prepare probably like 10 stocks, maybe more, that I'm following every day. So I'm following these stocks. And that's enough work for me, really following these specific stocks. Uh, Manish King, um, swing trading is leverage. Well, depends. I don't know. Depends on your account size. I'm, I'm very for swing trading. I think swing trading is great. And I think you should, you guys should do swing trading. I'm doing that myself too. And I, I don't do as much as I do in day trading, but um, I love doing that too. And yes, I use my Colmex account and I do get leverage from Colmex. And I use that leverage. Um, I don't really use it for swing trading. I use it for intraday trading, but I definitely use that. Uh, about my swing trading posts, um, um, like I did before. I'm actually working on something which I believe is better. So I stopped posting my swing picks, um, something I was doing since 2008. So I did it for 10 years and I got tired of that too. But I came out with a different system. We're going to start doing that soon, very soon here on our um, Facebook page. So it's going to be a process where you guys are going to start helping us picking stocks and we're going to do it like a collaboration in between us. So you're going to pick up some stocks. We're going to review them. We're going to suggest our own and the end result, in my opinion, is going to be much better than it was. So I'm working on a new system. It was a bit delayed. It was supposed to come out like two weeks ago. Sorry for that, but it's going to come up again. So I stopped doing something nice, but I'm going to start doing something better. I hope. What is the max loss for every trade? Do you mean like my trades, I mean? I try not to lose more than, um, I mean, on, on regular size, let's call it, I try not to lose more than 60 cents, something like that. So it's, uh, you know, uh, 4,000 shares, that would be anywhere between 2,500 to $3,000 uh, each trade. Sometimes I go more, but that would be my max loss. Uh, max loss has to be determined according to your account size, to how much money you are able to, or willing to lose, that is something that needs to be discussed. If I mean that, that is very personal. Also, uh, my max loss is uh, based on um, anywhere between thirty to sixty cent loss, and according to that, I would determine my quantity. Like if I'm seeing a trade that I may lose, let's say a dollar, 
And of course, that means that I need to see a target of a dollar. We discussed the one-to-one -one risk award earlier. Then I will reduce my size. No, well, now, 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 now it's it's becoming a little bit more complicated. Will I reduce my size? That has uh, that's something also I would like to talk about. Well, the answer is I will usually, but not always. For example, if I have uh, let's say fifty cents stop loss, and I'm starting with four thousand shares, so I may be losing uh, two thousand dollars. Now, will I be reducing my size if I'm seeing a trade where I have a $1 stop loss? What do you think about that? Should I reduce my size? What's your answer? Yes, no? Let's see if you have more questions here. Do I ever trade, take positions pre-market? Never do that, Ravi. I, I highly suggest you won't do that too. I have done that for so many years in the past. And let me tell you something. I tried to crack that pre-market system and I just didn't. I never ever managed to crack it. So you know what? If I would never trade pre or post market, my account would be like 200 or $300,000 higher than it is right now. I lost so much money in pre and post market. And I can tell you, terrible stories about that and so many reasons why you shouldn't trade pre-market but you know people don't really listen out before they get burned so hopefully hopefully you won't I suggest don't trade pre-market So you're saying I should, I should reduce my size. Okay. Well, that, that that's true. I should reduce my size, but I don't always. And, you know, trading is not black and white. Trading has a lot of shades. And what happens, for example, if I'm seeing a stock that looks just amazingly great, I love it. I love the trend. I love the technical formation. I love what I see. So should I really remain with my original size or add? I may add. So if I'm seeing a stock that I have a $1 stop loss and looks amazingly good, I may take the risk and trade it with full size. Or maybe I will reduce, but I will not reduce 50%. You see what I'm saying? Trading is not absolutely clear at all times. It has to do with the stock that you're trading. It has to do with... What the market's doing? I mean, is the market crashing down and I'm shorting? Maybe I should add a little bit more. You're planning to take a trade. Let's not talk about my size. You're planning to take a trade with 400 shares. Maybe sometimes you should, if you see an amazingly good looking uh, technical formation, go up to 500, 600. You should. I'm going back to the casino now. Because uh, when I'm when I'm playing in the casino, I'm, I'm I'm playing blackjack. And if you are a little bit aware of blackjack, it depends on what the dealer has. So if the dealer comes out with a bad card, and you coming out with a great card, you should, as we as it's called in blackjack, double down. If you're doubling down, you 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 have more success. I mean, you you started with having a a, a better success chance. Now uh, you're doubling down because you you your trade is looking better. That's the same as day trading, same thing. If you don't take more size, when you see a great trade, it will be harder for you to succeed. So yes, I am sometimes adding or taking a bigger risk with the same size, which is just like adding. That's it. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that institutional traders don't deal with stocks under $10, but you can find in Finviz that uh, institutions own lots of stock under $10, like Fate, like uh, Ford, uh, Snap, GoPro, and so on. Uh, no, no conflict in that. Uh, again, the $10 rule is not a clear black and white rule. There's, first of all, 95% of institutional traders are not allowed to trade stocks under $5, under $10. And so that's 95% right. Then there's 5% who are allowed. 
those 5% are very, very likely not allowed to trade stocks under $5. So that's another rule you need to know about. And the other thing about uh, stocks that are under $10 is that they are allowed to trade stocks under $10, assuming they are not small caps. Stocks, 99% or maybe I'm not sure about the number, 90 something percent of the stocks under $10 are small caps. Uh, small caps has nothing to do with the price, has to do with the, um, with the, I mean, the, I don't want to get into this now, I mean, uh, the capital of the company and so on. Uh, so, uh, but you can look up small caps, medium caps, large caps, I'm not going to get into this. We do it again in Star Trek because we don't do it here. But um, s stocks under $10 are very, very likely to be small caps. Now you can say that Ford is a small cap. Snap is not a small cap. GoPro is not a small cap. So you see, there are stocks under $10, which are not small caps. And institutional traders, although they're not allowed to trade stocks under $10, are definitely allowed to trade those. But it's a very important tool and you should, and you should um, pay attention to that, to stocks under $10. The new system on Facebook, is it expected to have better latency than YouTube? You mean like um, stocks are going to be coming out earlier? I'm, I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, the, one of the reasons it's being a little bit delayed is because we are still working on the rules. So um, I can't give you a definite answer here. What kind of books did I read, did I read when I started trading? Started strategy and psychology. Well, when I started uh, trading, I read plenty of books. They all had to do with uh, strategy and psychology, both. And I read some psychology books too. can't remember which right now, but I did at least one. So the problem is when I started out reading those books many years ago, I loved them uh, because the writers looked to me like... Um, Winners, amazing traders. I love them. I adore them. Later, sadly, I found out that most of the books that I read were written by people who were not successful traders. And let me tell you something. 95% um, of the books that you'll find uh, are written by people who cannot make money in the market. And I only found that out years later like uh, five or six years later when I started trading, after I started trading and I, I became successful after a few years, I was reading those books again. I was just going back to those books and I was reading them once more and I took a look at the book that I really loved. And all of a sudden I, I was reading stuff that just couldn't be true. I mean, how could this person say this or that if he's a successful trader? He couldn't. He just couldn't. He couldn't teach this. He couldn't say that. Now, you have to uh, draw a very um, strong line between um, successful trader and good educators. Uh, very rarely you will find a book that is written by a successful trader. Um, many books are good as, as from the educating part, but they're not complete because the person who wrote them don't know how to make money. Maybe they know how to make money teaching. Maybe they know how to make money selling books. Uh, but um, they definitely are not successful traders. And you can only find that out after several years. So I read the, I read a lot of books, but they were all wrong. They helped me at the beginning, but they, they just weren't perfect. Let's call it this way. So I'm not saying don't read books, read. Just be aware that some of the stuff you're reading may be all wrong. tell you about some success stories from my program. The last thing I'm going to do that, Scott, I'm not going to tell you any success stories from my program. I'm, I'm, if, if I'll find the time, I'll tell you about the horrible stories of people who are losing money and uh, can't make it. And that would be um, more than 50% of the people who join my program. And you need to understand that uh, most people in trading are losing money. 
Now, we'll try and make our best. We'll try and teach you and we'll try and develop you as a trader and try and, and give you all the support we can live. And gladly, our success rate, I believe, is higher than our competitors. But tell you what, most people are losing money in trading. So if I'm going to try and convince you to get into our programs by showing you success stories, that's the last thing I'm going to do. I'm not going to do that. There are, of course, plenty. You can read about it. You can go even on our Facebook page. But tell you what, um, you need to be ready to lose. You need to be ready for a hard time. You don't need success stories to guide you. You need horrible stories to guide you. You need to get away from, to find ways to stop losing, to find ways to put a stop loss where you should, um, to fight your demons. You really need to know the bad part about trading in order to succeed. Uh, success stories will just make you trade more, over trade, uh, trade with more size than you should, uh, do all sorts of things that um, final result would mean that you won't be with us. And that will be the worst thing. Uh, tips for, I'm not sure I understand, David has um, tips for making your winners the same size as losers when trading one to one. I mean, the first thing I look for, if that's your question, I'm not sure. The first thing I look for is is where my stop loss is. You know, I'm looking where my, I, I'm trying to figure out where my stop loss is, and then I'm trying to look at the personality of the stocks that I'm trading, and I'm trying to find if there's a chance it's going to reach my target. So, the only tip I can give you is first look for a stop loss, then take a good look and see if there's a potential in getting the same, uh, like if you're risking 30 cents, if there's a potential to make 30 cents too. I hope I answered your questions, but I'm not sure. You have problem, Tito, uh, exiting at your stop loss. How can you make it better? Well, it's all about discipline, of course. I, I usually don't suggest people to use hard stops, but tell you what, to new beginners, to novice traders, definitely use a hard stop. So I suggest my new traders to use hard stops. So use hard stops. If, that's, if you're just starting, use hard stops. Force yourself to move out. Really just force yourself to move out. It's all about discipline. If you cancel your hard stop, I can't help you. But once you start realizing that hard stops work and that should be your stop and you start making money, stop using hard stop and, stop and start using mental stops. That's you should. But uh, that should probably be after at least four to six months of trading. Uh, ascending and descending um, triangles. I did not mention that in my book. I think I did. Uh, I think I did Linux. That has to be on the technical formation part and the, on the beginning. I, I didn't really get much into it, but there's some technical formations, pictures and some explanations must be there. What do you think about the rules? I'm not risking more than 1% of my account size each day. I have 10K account size. Um, that's a good rule. That should be uh, your rule. But you must be a little bit flexible. I mean, you must be a little bit flexible. You, well, it's not more than 1%. Your, your, your risk should be 1%. That's, that's, again, what I've teach my traders. Your risk should be anywhere between one to two percent so less than one percent is not right one percent is right especially if you have uh, ten thousand dollars to risk i mean that's your account size you can't really risk that so it has to be minimum of one percent and anywhere between one to two percent you should come to the point where you may be risking up to two percent per trade 
up to means let's say your accounts are you, you, you're trading 400 shares so sometimes you may want to trade 800 shares because you're seeing a perfect trade you should be risking anywhere between one to two that is something i can support up to one hard i don't think you can do it Um, Ellen asks, asked earlier, I'm just going back to some questions I missed. I'm sorry, guys, if I missed any of your questions, really sorry. Ellen asked us earlier if uh, if it's the right thing uh, for people to do more, to short more than to go long. And uh, I noticed that more and more people are inclined to short these days. And, well, I don't know about other traders, but I'll tell you about myself, Ellen. Uh, shorts, shorts works better in my opinion than longs and that is because fear works better than greed so when the stock's coming down it's more likely to come down and continue the trend is better uh, the momentum is better and again fear is better than greed so i don't know about other traders but absolutely absolutely shorts are working better than longs so definitely definitely concentrate on your shorts there's one more thing i would say most people go long most people lose money if you want to make money in trading you should do the opposite really seriously that's the rule in trading so shorting to start with you have a better chance than to go long <laughs> uh, Daniel, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about writing um, another book. But it took me like four years to write this book, so... And I didn't start the new one, so... <laughs> I may. I'm, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you like it. Really. How long would it take to be traded to decent performance? More interested in the process. Well... Adolfo, let me say you let me say this. Um, you know, I can talk about averages, but average is a hard thing to say. I mean, it's not always right when that's an average. So I would say this. Um, the best case I've seen is people who are, who are making a lot of money after six months of trading. That is very, very, very rare, but I've seen some of them do that. Uh, most of the people that are making money, if of course they're getting to the point that they are making money, and as I mentioned earlier, most people fail. But those who succeed are starting to make money anywhere between one to three years. The majority would be anywhere between one to two years. So usually people who are taking it serious enough, have enough funding, um, have a good level of discipline, uh, those people are making it anywhere between one to two years. That would be the majority. Some after three or more, but very rare. Some less than a year, very rare too. <laughs> Thanks. Well, who's the loser in the CFD? You are aware that I'm trading CFDs rich, right? So yes, there are a lot of losers. There's a lot of winners. Um, firstly, let me ask you a question. Why would you care? I mean, if you're trading a system, a stock, sorry, platform, a trading platform like I do, if you're trading a, a, a trading platform like I do, which comes with live bid and ask, um, market bid and ask, and you're trading the bid and the ask, 
and you have unlimited liquidity. The unlimited liquidity is not exactly true, but uh, it's, I mean, compared to the real market trading, it's just I'm trading 4,000 shares, clicking in, clicking out, which is a trader's dream come true. And I'm doing that with market bid and ask. And I always get filled on bid and ask. Who cares who's on the other side? Who cares if the broker's making or losing money? First, don't worry about brokers. Brokers always make money. Brokers always make money, even if you're losing money, especially CFD brokers, because they are market makers. On the other hand, think about the US market. Is there no CFD in the US market? Of course there is. 60% of the trades that you trade end up at market makers. So they don't call it in the US CFDs. They have other names like market making, of course, options, of course, futures. So there's contracts everywhere. There's market makers everywhere. Do you really care who you're selling to? Like if it's Goldman Sachs or Mary Lynch, do you care who's on the bid, who's on the ask? The only thing you should care about is that you have a tight spread. If you have a tight spread and nobody plays with that spread, then who cares? You don't care. Market making is making money. The market making is losing money. Who cares? And don't worry, they are making money and a lot of money. Market makers always make money. We used to say, when I started out, uh, I met a person in the US, he said, um, in my next life, I'm going to become a market maker. <laughs> that's, a, some, that's something that uh, traders often say. So really, CFDs, they're the best. I have uh, unlimited liquidity. I'm clicking in, I'm clicking out. I have no slippage. Slippage used to cost me three cents per trade, three cents per trade. Just imagine how much money is three cents per trade. Go back to your trading account and calculate the previous year and add three cents per trade. I bet you, if you're losing money with three cents per trade, you will move to green territory. Three cents per trade. That's what I'm gaining at every, every CFD trade that I'm making. And lucky enough, I'm not a US resident. I can trade CFDs. You can use, you can, you can, you can trade CFDs too if you are in the US, but not your own account. You can join a prop firm, funded account like we have, for example, different things, but you cannot open a Colmex account like I do, for example. If you live outside the US, that's a common practice. Everybody around the world is using CFDs. I mean, who would like, who is anybody normal who would use, who would trade stocks? No reason. Otherwise, there, are, there may be investors, there may be long-term players, and they would like to get dividends, stuff like that, which you do not get in CFDs. Am I always trading with 4K? K? Uh, I'm trying to, yeah. And successful trader, why don't you increase your size? Go <laughs> Good point, Linux. I'll tell you what. Um, I recently checked my trading and I, I had a few days when I was trading with less quantity than 4K and I was and I was making more than I was making when I traded with 4K. So tell you what, I'm I'm actually considering lowering my size because going up with size doesn't mean you're going to make more money. It means sometimes you're going to lose money. The fact that I'm making money in trading 4,000 shares per trade doesn't make doesn't mean that that's the suitable amount of shares that I'm trading and I'm telling you right now I'm I'm considering in lowering my size rather than growing my size and then when I'm doing I'll be doing better when I go back down to 3000 or 2000 I may consider going up so I'm certainly not thinking about going up uh, more than 8000 right now absolutely not maybe reducing my size and that, you know, it's not about just, it's not just a mathematical thing about, you know, just going up with size. It's all about the mental capability. Are you mentally capable to trade more than certain size? I'm not. Not now. Maybe in the future. And there's more reasons. There's no, these fees do not uh, apply to CFD trading, James. Some of them do like, um, um, how do they call it in CFDs? Hmm. There's no FINRA, there's no SEC, there's no 
is CN fees, but there's there's something there's I can't remember how they call it. There's something there, but it's less anyway in CFDs. CFDs are, are cheaper. Uh, Philip, did I miss any, uh, your question? How long would you suggest trading in paper trading account before moving to real money? Well, I didn't really read what uh, um, Clifton answered you. I, I guess he did. But let me give you my answer and I'm not going to read his. Um, although he's very experienced and he's probably gave you the right answer. But let me tell you, let me tell you this. The less you can. Uh, CFD tra um, sorry, demo trading is terrible. Demo trading brings up different type of behavior which you don't want to practice while you're trading live. So demo trading is is not something you should do. Other than just you know, checking out your platform, learning how to operate your platform, getting some basic knowledge. Not more than few weeks. Few weeks would be the maximum. And if you would have met me like uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and probably be one of my first students. Actually, I started teaching like 14 years ago. So if you would met me 14 years ago, I would I would tell you a different story. I would tell you as much as you can, um, get to the point where you make money. That was a foolish thing to say back then. I wasn't experienced enough. And now after teaching tens of thousands of traders, I can tell you that I did a big mistake saying that to my traders. That was a foolish thing to do. You shouldn't trade. Uh, you shouldn't trade uh, demo accounts. Um, if you want to learn anything about trading, really, trade live. Start with twenty shares, whatever. Just make it live. That's a different ball game. You will learn much more than trading demos. Just don't do demos as 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 little as you can. <laughs> uh, what I don't like about Colmex and I want to improve some many things, many things. I love the platform. It's great. It's probably the best platform I ever traded, but there's a lot of suggestions, suggestions I made uh, that uh, I hope are going to be taken care of. And I don't want to get into some, I, I don't, I'll give you some very small clue. Big things are coming. And I leave it this way. Some big things are coming next few months. I'm reading my tape. Okay. You have any tips for YouTube clips about reading level two? Uh, level two is uh, very important. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Daniel, level two is. Um, I mean, I was trading today and I was watching the level two specifically when I was trading uh, G TGTX. I'm still looking at uh, the trade right now, <laughs> right here on the right side. So um, um, I was I was definitely looking at that, for example, at the point where I wanted to get my passion. It was very important. So definitely a very important thing uh, to watch level two, but it's not the holy grail. Some people think it is. Tell you what, it's not. It's just one tool. It's a very important tool, but sometimes it may mislead you. I can't get into the details right now, sorry, but it may mislead you because it meant to mislead you. Some players, bigger ones than I am, will use the level two in order to distract you, in order to sell you stories that are not really there, show you a large quantity that they want to sell. So you need to learn your way around this. You need to understand when they're fooling, you don't always know, and uh, to find out where you are very likely not to be fooled. And just going to take time. But don't use it as your main tool. If you're going to use it as your main tool, you're going to fail. Use it as one of your most important tools, not your main tool. Okay. <laughs> and my father just joined, as you can see. <laughs> Any questions about trading? 
dear father. <laughs> it's not real. Um, that's it, traders. Um, I enjoyed being here with you. I probably missed some of your questions. I'm sure I missed them. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, I act, it actually took me some time to realize that the questions are coming from the bottom, not from the top. <laughs> that's what happens when you get over 50. Um, and um, so, and then, and then I, I, I know I missed some. So next time, or at the trading room or whatever, I mean, uh, I hope I answered most of you. Those I didn't answer, it's it's not because I didn't, I, I, did, I didn't want to answer. It's just that, really, believe me, I didn't see them. So just keep them for the next time. I'm not going to miss any, I hope, next time. I'm going to be more uh, professional about this uh, YouTube uh, live videos, which is the first one I'm doing ever. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here with me today. And I uh, really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to see you. And if you didn't yet join us, I mean, uh, live trading room for free 14 day trial, I'm often being asked, like, okay, so what's the catch? Yeah, there's no catch. You can join us for free 14 day trial. We won't ask for your credit cards. Uh, we won't ask for anything. Take our free challenge. There's certain things you can get for free. They're not all for free. But use them. Use them to learn. Uh, it was a pleasure being with you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time and uh, answering your questions if I missed any. Thank you. Bye-bye.